Welcome everyone to the European Studies Center. And we have a lot of um, friends from America joining us. And I want to introduce the European Studies Center because it's very similar to the European Studies Center that our special guest of honor, Andy Markovitz, is so closely associated with. It's an interdisciplinary center, history, politics, sociology, economics of Europe. And we bring scholars from different generations and different disciplines together in a friendly atmosphere and we approach contemporary issues but also in the longer historical context very much like the European Studies Centre at Harvard that both Calypso and Andy were so closely associated with. And we do 60 to 80 events per year and I've been here for I don't know how long but this is a truly special event because it makes it very easy for the chair to introduce the speaker because you don't need to introduce the speaker because the whole seminar is devoted to introducing the speaker because his book is about his life, it's about his academic experiences, it's intellectual interests, but also about friendship, passion for culture, sport, a life um, that actually symbolizes a particular experience of the 20th and 21st century. And I had dinner with Andy um, last night, we spent about three and a half, four hours chatting about people that we knew and had to come across and so on, because I met Andy for the first time in about 1991, when I was also at the European Studies Centre at Harvard, and I remember him very, very vividly as one of the key people there, leading um, with Guido Goldman um, the, the study group on Germany, which was um, a very, very interesting regular event for those who are interested in the subject. And we went through names and people have come across and there were so many overlaps, even though we have different experiences, different generations, but Andy knows so many people all over the world connecting to so many different interests that um, we had a wonderful conversation. We also agree there's a German tradition that the chair speaks longer introducing the speaker than the lecture and summarizes and we agreed I will not do this. I just introduce Andy Markovitz, professor in three subjects at the University of Michigan and Alba. He's in the literature and language department in sociology and political science after a long career, um, first at Columbia, then Harvard, and he will talk about that, but also Wesleyan College and Boston University. Andy, you are extremely welcome. And there's so many friends in the audience. We're looking forward to what I um, expect to be a fascinating talk and conversation about a life that is unique from a scholar who is a public intellectual and a true um, scholar of all and many disciplines. Andy, start sharing your book, The Passport as Home, Comfort and Goodness. I read the whole book with fascination and, and passion, and it's, it's a wonderful book. Hartman, thank you so much. It's uh, an honor beyond words for me to be here. Um, yes, Oxford is a unique place. It has um, amazing standing in the general pantheon of the academy, but a special one for me. Um, I'm really that are beyond words and honors to be here. I'm also delighted and honored that some dear friends are here. First and foremost, Peter Pozza, um, who actually does appear in the book as the venerable uh, Peter Pozza, um, who has been a special, special friend for decades now. Willie Patterson, with whom I had lunch, I haven't seen him in a long time. Again, um, and these are dear friends who mean a lot. And uh, then to have um, uh, two uh, commentators of uh, Timothy's and Calypso's uh, caliber is um, really uh, just stellar. And I'm, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative. Um, let me sort of, what I'll do is, is, is make it very short and, 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 uh, I think the best gigs so far on the book, and there've been quite a few, and I'm very pleased about that, 
where typically when people, like we had a wonderful one at Harvard at the center, when people started asking questions and we get into the debate. Okay. So here's the book very briefly. There are really, I would say, four parts to it. The first part, in chronological order, the first part is delineating my Habsburg existence. Uh, born in Timisoara in a uh, 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 multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual little house on Strada Kutuzov Numer Uno. Um, and there were the Protestant, although I'm not sure whether they were Calvinist or, 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 or Lutheran, Hung Hungarians in the bottom, the Hoydus, next to us the Tsuneas who were Romanian Catholics, uh, and above us, the Tsikalas, who were, of course, Romanian Orthodox in the Regat, and then the Markovitzes, um, uh, who were uh, middle class Jews, neolog, as it was called at that time, neolog Jews, um, ravaged by the Holocaust, uh, 26 family members that carried it out in the research. Um, but if you were to uh, have done a, a, if you were a, a, an anthropologist and would have done a, a sort of ethnographic study of the Markovitz family, you would have not known that this family was ravaged by the Holocaust because all you saw in the childhood uh, records of Beethoven, Bach, Brahms, and so on and so forth. In other words, this was a place of German cultural capital um, in which uh, I grew up uh, and uh, lived actually a very comfortable life, although there were elements of Stalinism, which I gathered already when uh, the Holocaust reaches me through my aunt Monsi, who would wake up in the middle of the night and uh, would scream, don't leave me, mother, don't leave me, mother. She, of course, was in Auschwitz. Um, my father and mother were not in Auschwitz. They were in Timisoara, which saved their lives um, uh, because the, the Romanian Jews there were not deported. Um, and so uh, it's about that. And I go to a German elementary school, Nikolaus um, Lenau Schule, named after the lyricist Nikolaus Lenau whom I later encountered in my studies of European anti-Americanism because he detested America, as so many of these romantic intellectuals did at the time. Um, and so it's this, it's this is an interesting part of, of my life, which really describes the German Bildungsbürgertum and how massively it influences Jews who were otherwise would have really dis hated Germany. Um, this does come to a fore on uh, July 4th, 1954, when my father and I are listening on our Grundig radio to the great World Cup final between the Hungarian Aron Chapat, the golden team against the, the, the Germans. And the Germans win, which is the second largest upset in World Cup history. Sapashi George, to use the Hungarian correct, because the last name first, was the, the, the amazing commentator and the very famous commentator. And he was literally crying. And this was a major event. And I remember my father, I, I, we were listening to this and we knew the Hungarian team, we knew their players. I can still recite this, I won't do it, but if you want, but I still think from, from that era, it's very interesting, Boris kind of, I still mention the Hungarian team, uh, the Brazilian Selassau, um, we'll never forget this. And uh, and my father, we would you would assume that we would be very upset about the Hungarians losing. And my father, after the, the broadcast, said, well, it's life important. He turns off and said, he was not upset. And I kind of look at him and, and he said, in Hungarian, this is not important to you. Uh, these are two evil nations who sort of, uh, which I learned in Yiddish, they got the bond, in bond, in other words, both in the, in the, in the, in the end, which I learned actually in New York, I've become an, an East European Jew in New York. Um, and uh, the only thing that matters to you 
is today is the birthday of the United States of America. America must have looked at him, you know, at the age of five and a half, like deranged. What is this? The only thing that I knew about America was that I had an uncle there who occasionally would send me toy cars. Okay, my mother dies, we leave Romania. End of story. Second part of the story is the transition part uh, between 1958 59 and 1967, when we live in Vienna and I go to the Theresianische Akademie. Uh, may it, may it be always an infamy. I really detested the place. And in some ways, it was a very repressive uh, authoritarian gymnasium, uh, which was, by the way, very much part of the Zeitgeist. This is not unique to the Tezian. And where basically uh, learning was there was a form of social control. I was one of two Jews in the entire school. And in the school I actually, be, which I really dis disliked, uh, I become friends with three, with four people, all of whom actually are marginal. One of them, three of them were two Americans uh, and a, 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 an Austrian kid who then goes to Italy with his father. And I become very close to the headmaster, close. The headmaster is an important player in my life, Dr. Roger Caliber who tells my father after the Aufnahmsprüfung when we were so worried whether we could get in, my father was sweating profusely and then how, how could a Jew, Jewish student be there and said he, he will be fine. And Roger Kerber becomes kind of an ally of sorts. So he was the headmaster of the school. And, um, I will leave Vienna, although actually uh, Hartman said it's the most exciting part. Actually, in the book, we live in Intermite. It's a very interesting, contradictory thing um, in Vienna, but we're on our way to the United States. When we arrived in 1960, we thought, end of Vienna. Here is America. And when we arrived, this I think in the book, and many people think it's the most powerful chapter is my arrival in New York, okay, which was phenomenal in the sense that we finally enter and the immigration officer is with an, an Italian guy with an, an M. I will never forget his name, Mangione, Marconi, Monteretti, whatever. And he was blowing pink bubbles, okay, chewing gum, blowing pink bubbles. And actually at some point he even talks to me because my English already was in a tad better than my father's because I was studying English already with Vago naming in Timisoara. And um, so I always think what would have happened had an, an, a, 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 an unpleasant guy be, uh, been our, been, been our uh, immigration officer, even give me some forms. And then we walk out finally and um, Here's our uncle, my uncle picking me up. And I thought my uncle in America is Clark Gable or Cary Grant or some gorgeous guy I mean, in America. And here comes this shuffling, beaten down, old East European Jew who doesn't smile ever, who embraces my father. And of course, it makes sense because he lost his first wife and four sons in our place. And so here is this guy, and, and so, and then we go out to get a cab, and we get into this cab, and it's a yellow, beautiful Basoto, and on the side, there's all these numbers, you know, half a mile, 20 cents, and this already is very cool, and we get in, and the driver is an African-American, my first African-American, the only African, Afro person I knew was Pele, the great Brazilian striker. I remember before that I never had seen an African or, or a black person. And on the way back to Manhattan, it's a glorious sunny day. And this guy, I'm sitting up front and he's blaring really phenomenal kick-ass rock and roll. And he's one-arming the car and going down the Van Wick. And here's Manhattan. And back is my father and my, my and his brother, my uncle, talking to Whatever. I mean, they were, it was painful. And this was America. 
And then that evening, we go to Horn and Hard Arts in Times Square, which is now actually is a great documentary called The, the Automat. This was a fully automatic, uh, automated restaurant, so to speak. You threw in money and out come sandwiches. A very interesting social equalizer. By the way, I was on. What a country. And of course, the camel ad on Times Square. We had a hotel in Times Square, a lousy dump of a hotel. But on Times Square and um, the camel ad where every five seconds there was a smoke coming out of the guy's mouth. Um, so the point is that we're in America and my father decides to go back to Austria. Uh, because, and let me just say one incident which I pay attention to in the book, is where he really does not understand. He loved America, but he was not the cold. Is the famous $10 bill where he drops it. My father was a very impatient man and he believed that you, know, you could pull rank all the time. And he had a guest who had a restaurant, a reservation, a restaurant, and he didn't want to stand in line, something that I don't like either. And he thought, you know, hey, this is Vienna or Timisoara, you can drive your way in. And he walks up to the maitre d' and hands him a $10 bill. And the maitre d' drops it. I, to, I, I, as I speak to you, it really gives me the chills because. My father was completely embarrassed. And here is this little boy seeing his father completely out of his element. He didn't understand that part of America. And on his deathbed in Vienna in 1990, he tells me in Hungarian, I failed America, but you succeeded. I failed in it. Java Voltom. I was actually Vafage. I, I was I was a coward not to conquer America. And we go back to Vienna. And I dread it. And I basically live in America while I'm in Vienna, listening to American Forces Network radio, becoming a base, but basically having this life in the United States. And with Bill Gillespie, who is the son of the of the, of the military attaché. So here's this kid from Romania and this. Uh, you know, very waspy kids from, from who actually become very close friends. Anyway, end of story. Fascinating Vienna. Next thing, Colombia, uh, where uh, just two items, uh, the clash between the old and the new. Uh, I've accepted the Colombia, and of course, there is freshman orientation. But I've, I've gotten some advanced credits because of my, by virtue of my gymnasium. So, freshman orientation. You're not a freshman, but you don't need orientation. The arrogance that my father and I had about this, how college was unimportant, onward to real university. We have already Eichmann Bildung. I don't want to learn about Homer and whatever. This we have in Europe. Okay, you don't need this. And so when I get to go to the foreign academic advisor, where I get these credits accredited, uh, one thing he says, uh, of course, you have to take contemporary civilization and humanity one on one. And I go, excuse me, I've read Homer. And that's when he basically, you know, I don't care if you are Homer, you have to take me. <laughs> and it changed my life. Because, of course, we had Homer in Keresiano, but it was all rote learning. It's a wonderful stuff. Just one other clash at Columbia, and I will not talk about the politics of Columbia. Other clash is my first midterm exam, microeconomics, and we get the, the set, and the teacher, the professor, leaves the room. What, what, is, what do you mean he leaves the room? In the Keresian, when we wrote a, a, a Schulabag, they had extra people watching us because we, everything was about, you know, everything was about chumen. Everything was about basically cheating. How do you actually help each other? And how, to, how do you subvert authority? And here, suddenly, there is no authority. And I was completely dumb. So I didn't understand. I didn't know how to do the sec second set problem. I looked around, and there was a guy next to me, long hair. And I think long hair, I just said to him something I hate. And the look he gave me chilled me to this day. He looked at me like, you scum. 
How dare you challenge the honor code? And above all, not only are you scum, you are really stupid. You're at Columbia, you need cheating? How did you get in here? I mean, this is all in his book. Afterwards, when Hanson, it's the only blue book I ever failed, I got zero, I just froze. Um, uh, when he hands in this blue book, I see an SDS button on his shirt. So this was a student radical, but the radicalism only pertained to macro politics. When it came to being a Columbia student, you were in competition with everybody else and you better not cheat. Fascinating story. Anyway, um, Columbia, my friendship with Robert Austin is Harvard, uh, and then I stopped. Um, about to finish my PhD at Columbia, and I was very, very much influenced by a number of authors whom I read Barrington Moore, other than, of course, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, and so on. But Barrington Moore uh, very much, and Seymour Martin Lipset uh, was a very famous sociologist at the time. I find it so sad that in the academy, people fade. Some of my doctoral students now don't know Carl Deutsch, which is outrageous, but whatever. Um, uh, anyway, and uh, so here's the thing. And um, uh, I, uh, I decided I had a little savings and my father would start help me with supplemental things. I wanted to go to Harvard and be with Seymour Martin Lipset for a year. Very un-American, not apply to anything, but just be there so that you know, and hang out and learn from him and be with him. So I go up there, rent a room in Cambridge, go up to see Seymour Martin Lipsith, and I walk in, and there are boxes all over in William James' office. And I say, Hi, Professor Lipsith, I'm here, and I'm about to defend my dissertation at Columbia. I'd like to come to Harvard and spend a year with you. Uh, and he looks at me and says, Well, it's very, I'm very sorry, but as you can see, I'm packed up. I'm going to Stanford in two days. And he said, have you heard of the Center for European Studies? I said, maybe. Um, I, have you heard of Guido Goldman? I said, related to Nahum Goldman? And Nahum Goldman, the head of the World Jewish Congress to European Jews, continental European Jews was next to the Messiah. He is the guy who negotiates with Adenauer, he is the guy. And I remember my father, I went to see him in Vienna at the Intercontinental Hotel, and he was a major, major Yiddish, to use a good Yiddish word. And he said, yes, the son of. And he writes something, folds it, puts it in an envelope, and says, give this to Guido Goldman. Turn around, go to it, and go to the Center for European Studies. And I arrived at the Center for European Studies, and it was really about end with this. It was a period piece, because this is very much a story of the 60s. I arrived at the Center for European Studies. It's an old New England style, it's a shabby house, basically, the old center. And I walk in there, and people are sort of milling about, and in the reading room like this, there are lots of newspapers, Le Monde and Figaro and Süddeutsche Zeitung, and you know, beautiful, beautiful posters of Toulouse, Lautrec and others that Guido gave that, you know, and people are sort of hanging out. What is this? Am I in like a commune or something? Great. And then Abby Collins comes, who is this very open woman, looks at me very, I have beads around my neck, long hair, and it's like, who the hell are you? But, and then I said, look, I'm here to see Dr. Goldman. He said, oh, why don't you wait a little bit? He'll be late and we can talk, we can talk. And in the meantime, others are coming in. And these are legendary professors. Peter Gorlich, Peter Lang, Peter Pat. I mean, ma Peter, major people in political sociology, historical political science, all of them. And they, we start talking about baseball, about Weber, about Althusser, about all this the the the, the, the Pulanzas, later on the Pulanzas, Miliband debate, all these things, state and, and this is the Center for European Studies at the time. And I, it comes lunchtime, I say, I'm going to Harvard Square to pick up a sandwich. No, 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 stick around, we have enough salad, we share. And then Guido Goldman finally comes and he's this completely different guy. First of all, he's an academic with a cigar. You don't have academics with cigars. You have pipes, but not cigars. He's not an academic, but he's sort of an academic. 
And he's not a businessman, but sort of a businessman. And we go, go up to his office and he said, so? And I gave him this letter. And then he, I said, so you're the son of Nahum Goldman. He goes, wow, you know, my father. I said, actually, uh, in, indirectly. And he goes, no one here knows me. This is very interesting. How do you do this? And through this, we establish an amazing relationship over Jewishness in some hence way. We never talked about the Holocaust or Jewishness, about our relationship to Germany. Very different Germanys. Andy's Germany are the trade unions and, and the Greens and so on. Guido's are all the German chancellors, et cetera, et cetera, the German ruling class. But we, and basketball, uh, and above all, dogs. And we become this close thing. And so the Center for European Studies, which then forms me for the next 30 years, actually happened on a fluke. It all is contingent on Seymour Martin Lipset's note, which I don't know what it contained. And Guido's receptiveness and also the zeitgeist that was telling uh, uh, Hartwood yesterday, unthinkable in today's center, just geographically impossible. There would have been a receptionist, uh, you would, it would not, people wouldn't have been having lunch in this hippie, sort of poison. Right? Um, it was, was a different thing. So in many ways, this is also a story of the late 60s and the early 70s as well as the Columbia politics. And ultimately to end the story, I really end the, the book by giving thanks to some completely serendipitous and crucial people who changed my life in some ways. Number one, the Romanian soldier on the border between Romania and Hungary. For my father, there's some problems on with our passport because I'm on my mother's passport. So my mother actually does not exist. What's going on? And my father is pulled in and being interrogated in some place. And there's this young soldier, and I'm this kid. And this young soldier, and what do we do when he starts talking about Shinsa Timishwara? which was the soccer team, my soccer team. And he puts me at ease, even though later on, actually they literally bayonet my only teddy bear and because they felt that we were smuggling stuff. So since then I'm obsessed with teddy bears. I have over 500 at home. I go to bear auction. Um, so um, yeah. this guy, this soldier, really made an amazing guy. Um, Seymour Martin, the, the, the bubblegum New York immigration officer. Seymour Martin Lipson, whom I basically never meet afterwards. I never bothered him at various APSAs. I never sort of said, Professor Lipson, what did you write in that, you know, to, to Guido Goldman? That, no, I mean, I mean, who are you? What is this? And, I mean, actually wrote a wonderful blurb for my offside book on soccer. Um, and so that's the story. It basically stops in when all of, when I'm formed. After that, you know, it's just a normal professorial track, nothing new, nothing it's terribly really standard. And I think um, I'll stop there and leave others to ask questions. Thank you, Andy. It's um, a real challenge. Summarize one's life in 20 minutes when there's a full book of the life and which anecdotes you picked and so on. They were to some extent different than ones I would have picked, but we come back to that. Um, but in the book, it's very, it's quite when you talk to the soldier, there are two teams, and you were a bit scared whether, yes. whether I mean, when you mentioned when he asked you which team do you support, whether you supported the right team or the wrong team, and when. When you mentioned the team and he had that smile and that gave you a rapport with the soldier, I wonder what would have happened if we had picked the other team. And I mean, there are so many incidences in the book where it's so close, where is it going this way, this way, and so on. And the human factor that is in the book all the way through is one of um, the, the, the fascinating aspects of this book. But um, I think there are better commentators on this book than me. And one, of course, is our friend Philips and Nikolaidis, also from the European Studies Center at Harvard with the same gang 
Stanley Hoffman, Guido Goldman, all of them. So Calypso, you have the first right to reply to Andy's fascinating summary of his own life. And then we'll all come back and check in. Calypso. Well, indeed, Hartmut and Angie, it's, it's especially poignant for me to um, join Hartmut in welcoming you at this European Center, uh, where I'm so happy to be back literally two days ago and to be here to honor your autobiography and your life. Uh, indeed, because, well, I'm certainly not alone in this room in kind of feeling the echoes of being people with multiple identities and places and, and all of that. So I think there's many echoes in this room. But yes, we do have a special link um, from indeed those Harvard days in an other European center where I arrived a bit after you, but I was there also 15 years and we shared a place uh, all the way. And I realized today that actually we left the same year in 99. Uh, I left for here, you left for Michigan, um, and of course we were not exactly the same age, so me and my cohort, we looked up to you, and all of these characters that you spoke about, um, and, um, and of course, I, it's funny now that you talk about your love for teddy bear, because one of the strongest memory I have of you is this uh, wonderful uh, young faculty who was enthusiastic and kind at the same time, like a kind of smart teddy bear, <laughs> if I, if I may mix metaphors. Uh, but perhaps my relationship with the European Center, that the other place, the other one, was probably even more complex than yours because my multiple identity meant that my whole kind of French and German uh, roots, I wanted to be away from Europeans. I wanted to be a real, you know, plunge in the American. So I had an ambiguous relationship with the European Center. Maybe we can have a off the record conversation about this, but that changed over time. And I think you're right. And in the book, it's beautifully described the life we had there and the bridge, in fact, between those two European centers. We could, we could say much more, but I'm actually here to praise this book, uh, this beautifully story, beautifully said, uh, beautifully written, uh, in a way about both contingency and destiny, a strange mixture, and also a beautiful mix between being an elite and being a, a poor migrant, between hubris, you said about Omer, but also humility. In fact, I know today that you talk much more about others than about yourself. You paint all these other portraits. Um, and that also is a very beautiful thing. But what I want to do in this, the few minutes that I have is, is to be even more literal and talk about the title of the book, Passport as Home. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful title. Um, and I, in a way, want to ask you what it stands for. So I, I kind of see four Andes in the book, in, in a way, four figures of what passport at home means. You know, we have the wanderer, the exile, the marginal, and at the end, the ruthless cosmopolitan Jew. So that could be an ontological question, you know, which is like a thriller. Who is the real Andy Markovitz? You know, and maybe probably you will say all of the above. Um, so maybe there's less suspense than we can. But then there is perhaps a more difficult question, um, which is a more philosophical question, uh, which is about the paradox, at least ambiguities, that are contained in each of these figures, the, each of these anti figures. Um, and which is probably why the book and your life that it reflects is not only you know, fascinating as a life, as a life well lived and beautifully lived, but also kind of, if I may be a bit grand, emblematic of a bigger human condition, at least of some of us human. And in, in some ways for each of these kind of paradoxical figures, I kind of want to ask you um, how you feel today about these paradoxes. So the, the first figure, passport as home, is the wonder that passport is crossing a border, the crossing. Uh, and indeed, there is this kind of sense that th this is your the, the life threat, the passport. You can, you can escape. Uh, in fact, my husband's uh, father, who's Jewish, he always, and we see this country, you know, Jew in the UK, as far as I understand, it's not that dangerous, but he always had a suitcase with his passport in it. And he always checked very regularly to the end of his life that the passport was in the suitcase. So he could leave just like that. But then the paradox is, you know, do, do, don't 
didn't you acquire very quickly a very luxurious passport in the world where we live to you know and where you lived after the war you know we know that passports have very different value and in, in terms of access to wherever in terms of the kind of life and the kind of other borders that you can cross uh, and we can think of you know older you know Iranian people around the world who don't have the right passport so yes passport is a flight passport is, but it's also a, a, a privilege mm -hmm. then we have the second figure of the exile the exile is passport as home but it's about also leaving a home leaving your home of origins behind and that's the whole story of the beautiful, you know, beginning of the book, obviously, the, that you were reminding us of, you're leaving your Habsburg existence. Uh, and in fact, but it was a, not any old Habsburg existence, the periphery of the periphery, it was a periphery of the Habsburg, fascinating one at that. And why you really left is that there is no nostalgia in the book, you don't cry for having left, so you really left, you, you really truly left. And yet, did you ever really leave? That's my kind of second paradox. At least, you know, you start the book in this voyage of return to this place, this magical place where you were so welcome. And in fact, from what I understand from the book, is going back to Timi Sarara in, the, in giving these lectures and meeting these wonderful people that led you to write the book. I mean, it was kind of, okay, one of the sparks. So did you really leave? And and also, I would say, so much stayed with you. That's the story of the of the book. Just now you told us about your love-hate relationship with your Hungarian team. Of course, we all have love-hate relationship with all sorts of bits and pieces of Europe. Your multilingualism. Uh, and, and you never really left Europe. I mean, I, you know, one of the aspects, wonderful aspects of your book is European politics. Sorry, not of your book, of your life, of how we know of your books, what you've done in your life. And, and I, I would say not any old European politics. You care a lot about the European left, the mm -hmm. European, you know, center left, a certain kind of left with, sadly, if you ask me, is not doing that well in, 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 in Europe today, but you've always cared about that European left in a way that's, yes, scholarly, but I would also say, I mean, you know, not just scholarly. I mean, there is a kind of citizenship there. Uh, and it seems that to me that it's reciprocal. You know, you never left Europe, but Europe didn't leave you. And Germany offered you the Federal Cross of the Order of Merit, the, the biggest, you know, marriage you could have in Germany and all of that. So, so that's the second figure of the exile. And did you really leave your home of origins behind with that passport? Um, the third figure, the first and the third end is, is, you know, very central to the book, of course, the, this figure of the outsider. So this is not crossing, this is not leaving now, it's marginalizing or maybe self-marginalizing and your pride and happiness. And, this, and you talk about sense of, you always have this sense of strangeness, which I really like because it's such a beautiful ambiguity between being estranged by others and seeing others as, as strange. And I was wondering, but I don't want to be a psychoanalyst here, whether that's also the question of your relationship with your father, that he seemed to be estranged, but you control the gaze and you see the rest of the world as strange. But there again, you know, um, not being American, so you're outsider. You said, man, I'm not American. You're proud to be my, you know, tell your friends in the US you're not American. But how long can you not be American in, in America? Uh, I mean, I felt that. I mean, I had to constantly resist not becoming American. Uh, why? I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, uh, you, you speak of, the, you know, the baseball and the Grateful Dead and all of these American things. That, and you took anti-Americanism, I think, also quite personally. I mean, you, you spend so much time, you know, pushing back against uh, anti-Americans. So isn't that, or is that American? Or maybe it's not. Maybe you did it as a kind of moralist and the queen kind of uh, 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 attitude. But also from not being, from being not American, then there is this kind of bigger story about not fitting anywhere. Not fitting anywhere. And that's not exactly the same, really. Um, but I kind of read you as fitting everywhere rather than not fitting anywhere. Maybe you tell me it's two sides of the same point but i'm we're going back to big conversation tim tim garnash and i had so often indeed tim and with good hearts book you know somewheres and anywhere you you are many somewheres rather than perhaps an, an, a nowhere or an anywhere um and in fact not being the dominant culture as you write in the book 
um, to me is also being part of what young people today would call intersectionality. I know we the boomers are supposed to hate that word, but it's like the alliance of minorities. It's a really cozy home that, you know, that home of minorities. So it, it's kind of a home somewhere. Uh, and indeed, the connection then that you make, which I find also fascinating, that you didn't never want it to be boxed in in a kind of a discipline or in a certain approach or you know being orthogonal. So as a person, but also in your mind. But we can ask how that really works too. Aren't you always kind of all brought back to how you first learn things? So that was the third. And finally, perhaps the most important, of course, and it is the subtitle of your book. So passport as home as not those other uh, crossing borders, leaving a home, marginalizing yourself, but finally as, as a being, who you really are as a ruthless cosmopolitan, um, subverting the figure of the Jew as the ruthless cosmopolitan saying, I own this figure. And I love the contrast with the French deraciné. The French don't accept that you're ruthless. They just, you had roots and then you uprooted yourself. I never thought of that. And I'm always comparing France. And so thank you also for that. And, but it's also, of course, that story is so important, this euphemism. But then I, I, I'm back to, the, to the, the theme, rootless cosmopolitan. What do we do with this theme? Um, you know, Apia would say we are rootless, rooted cosmopolitan. Um, and indeed, the, the whole story of the Habsburg that you come back to is the story of pluralism and accommodation is indeed about, at the end of the day, reconciling these roots um, and in, in echoes to Kant, you know, that at the end of the day, to be hospitable, to be, you know, the world, you need to be anchored so that you have a home to open to others. So in, at the end, I, I would conclude that, you know, the beauty of the book is how, you know, you subvert categories and you, you, you tell your life in a way that echoes to so well in our minds and our experiences. Um, and that um, the, it's a book that is entirely, at the end, positive, although it's about ruthlessness, because perhaps the strongest message of the book, to me, is, is that this, whatever four entities come together in these four mm -hmm. figures um, of passports at home, um, is an entity that is endlessly open to other cultures, to enlarging his circle of friends, because who you became and who you've been in your life um, really made you this citizen of the world uh, that is at home, you know, everywhere. And I would uh, uh, include here at home with us here in Oxford. Well, we're so happy to see you. Thank you. Straight over to Jim yes, yes. Um It's delightful to be with you here on this evening when Andy Markovitz presents his autobiography, and possibly we start getting rid of Boris Johnson. <laughs> Evening, um, in both respects. Um, the obituary of um, Karl Popper in the Financial Times began with a wonderful line, like most British intellectuals of his generation, Karl Popper was born in Vienna. <laughs> um, and I thought of that line on reading this book, and it's another great Central European story coming from Hungarian, Romanian, Jewish, Timisoara, and then enriching the intellectual culture of the English speaking world, as so many other Central Europeans have done. And um, I will be quite brief because I know people want to come in and I have essentially three threads, each of which ends in a question to you. The first thread is the one that Calypso picked up, which is the title and subtitle, The Passport of Home, Comfort in Rootlessness, which is, of course, a familiar trope. Uh, George Steiner said, um, trees have roots, people have legs. Mm -hmm. And uh, David Goodhart already mentioned anywhere people and somewhere people. And I am always skeptical about these claims. Mm. I have never met a truly anywhere person. I've met a lot of people like me, like many people in this room, who are multiple somewhere people. I think that is the real distinction between multiple somewhere people 
and one somewhere people, not anywhere people, and one somewhere people, but like Calypso, I have to say, Andy, when I finished reading the book, I thought you you were you're at home in the United States. Yes. I, I, I really felt that. And um, um, it's, it's not so much the passport as home as Cambridge Mass as home, in a way, and the Centre for European Studies as home. So, so like Calypso, I had the same reaction. That while you're a multiple somewhere person, mm -hmm. actually, I felt you'd really found a home in, in the United States and, and in, in, in American intellectual life, and it'd be lovely to hear you comment on that. That leads me to the second thing, which is maybe your particular home with the Centre for European Studies at Harvard. And I think that is the place most similar to this place that I know. I don't know of any other Centre for European Studies in the world, which is quite like starting with the fact that we're both in old shabby houses <laughs> on the edge of campus. Um, with people uh, trying to be interdisciplinary in universities that aren't necessarily hospitable to that. And uh, I wanted to push you a bit, Andy, on what you think it is that makes a really successful Centre for European Studies, a really successful interdisciplinary centre, and whether with your long experience you think that is becoming more difficult mm -hmm. because my hunch is that it is because the disciplines are becoming not only the true organizational silos of the university but also becoming more professional and more specialized so that for example at oxford where in peter putz's day the department of politics had historians scholars of constitutionalism, political uh, historians of ideas, political theorists, all interacting. Now, as Calypso knows very well, there are three tribes, the IR tribe, the political science tribe, and the political theory tribe. And increasingly, they speak completely different languages. I once tried with a colleague, Leonardo Molino from Florence University, to try to bring together a group of people to talk about something that Isaiah Berlin talked about a lot, which is measuring freedom. And we had the political scientists from the Department of Politics and International Relations and the political theorists from the department on opposite sides of the table. Mysteriously, they sat on opposite sides. And it was a complete dialogue of the best. And actually, at one point, one said to the other, I forget which way it went, I literally don't understand what you're saying. So if people in the same department couldn't even understand each other, how, how does one make a genuinely interdisciplinary conversation? I mean, that's, a, I think, an interesting challenge. The third thread is, is the, well, maybe the first thread is the deepest, but the third thread is the broadest, which is you have a whole chapter in this book, which is about Germany, in which you say, you draw a distinction between Bundesrepublik and Deutschland, the, the, the two parts of the name of the Federal Republic of Germany, Federal Republic of Germany. And you say you're a huge fan of the Bundesrepublik, but you still have your doubts about Deutschland. And your explanation of that, it seems to me, shifts a little bit between two different positions. One is autobiographical that intellectually you have great admiration for the Federal Republic of Germany, but emotionally you can never forget your father telling you on the 4th of July 1954, when Pushkas played his famous game, that, um, that they were two evil nations and so on. But you also ask a series of questions, like how deep is really the intellectual and cultural and political transformation of Germany. And I just want to tempt you to say a bit more about that, whether it is simply, so to speak, the emotional reserve, or whether you find yourself perhaps particularly after unification with East Germany, because most of your work is on West Germany, mm -hmm. 
Um, perhaps in light of Germany's response to the war in Ukraine more recently, with intellectual grounds for that dichotomy as well as as well as emotional ones. Any lots of comments, lots of questions. Back to you. Of responding to well, I will not respond to all of them because they wonderfully did. Let me start with the last one because it's uh, in some ways the most hardest and also kind of the clearest. Um, you're totally right that basically the chapter on the Bundeswehr and the Deutschland is a story about sort of intellect versus emotion. And um, and as you well, uh, and and that on an intellectual level, I am uh, immensely impressed by having the Federal Republic having established a stable liberal democracy, which to me is always very important. I always hated that aspect of the new left that they could, you know, see, sees this as a form of fascism. Uh, so to me, liberal democracy really matters. Um, and that my uh, uh, emotional remnants of, of yeah, of my history. Um, I feel actually sometimes guilty about that, that in fact, I, I, I can't quite overcome it. Meaning that I, I would like to, and it's happening more, but I'd like to finally maybe even root when Germany plays. Uh, it, it still can't happen. I mean, to me, England the world, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it, 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 it just, it just, you know, but at least certainly happens when Germany plays Russia, which only plays, or, or so that because actually uh, with a friend at, at the center, they always play the, and he, let's look at the booting thing. So then you always give me Germany, Saudi Arabia. Germany, yeah. so outline, North Korea, <laughs> so down the line. Okay, good. Um, so um, uh, now just to, your, uh, to the, the, the question of whether intellectually there is something in the development, like for example, in the, in the, in the, in the with Ukraine, uh, that actually makes me feel more, I mean, all of which bleeds into the emotion that thereby I would have to be more favorable to, to Germany. I think there is something to that. And I, I but it's just an ongoing process. I can't respond to it for it. Uh, other than, um, part of me is very guilty about that, that I just, uh, uh, this is a country that on some level has done only wonderful things for me. And I should be um, much more, I mean, I'm grateful to my circles in Germany, and I love them dearly. And they actually always tell me I should not worry about sort of any kind of emotional guilt. It's fine. You, you know, you don't root you root for England still. That's okay. Um, so many things you asked. Uh, let and, me and beyond uh, Germany. I think what was interesting in the book is when you said since 1871, when the Germans look east, they see Russia. And yes. No real commitment to the people in between and we see this in the ukraine to a certain extent yes. and you're so angry with your left-wing friends when yes. the prague spring happens yes that they they are concerned about socialism and communism and so on but not the real suffering of the people and i think that um Good came point. very strongly in the book which resonates with what is happening right now again and then drawing out these long trends and your repulsion with i mean all your friends who don't see it yes. the way that you immediately feel it as being part from from that area and i think that's a it's just a phenomenon which is still there and i think it's it's important you put it into the book and it's important to draw it out in that context no i totally agree i mean uh, that i remember i mean the Dutschke and the and his pals show up in prague yeah. and then lecture these guys about it i mean it's just it's disgusting and, and, you know, and then social democratization, which are, they, they, they call it, uh, you know, and they, they, they find the, the, the Prague um, folks uh, sort of uh, uh, basically lackeys. Of, it's, it's horrible. And it also, not even intellectually, but also emotionally. So um, 
Next, the point about, um, let's not, not talk about what, what makes a successful Center for European Studies. I, um, you know, uh, you guys do. I mean, I, I don't, I have no idea. You're totally right that the trajectory is clearly away from this in terms of the reward structure. The reward structure is purely in departments. You will not get tenure in any of these places at Harvard, whatever, by virtue of being uh, an interdisciplinary. It's all about what you write in what, in fact, is counted in the department. So, uh, and also, you know, I don't know the center today anymore. I mean, it's a very different, I really think that it was part of a certain zeitgeist. Um, it was also unique that Stanley Hoffman, who um, somehow allowed under his aegis for this to, this crazy stuff about state and capitalism and all these sort of historically oriented political sociologists, like all of, all of us were, he let them flourish, like you know, Mao let thousands of uh, flowers bloom, except more successfully. Um, you know, Stanley actually didn't care about that. Yeah. And it's, it's 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 a very interesting story. And I had that you know where Stanley was asked about your most successful seminar, state and capitalism. He said uh, since eighteen hundred, which was run by Peter Hall. He said, um, you know, I, to tell you the truth, I've never attended it. And so it was kind of a, 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 a no other center was this. Uh, um, Louise, who, who should we have the, does she have to be called now Dame Louise? Or, the, the Dame Louise. Uh, Louise um, says Andy, you know, she had, a, she had, uh, yes, she was uh, knighted. Um, uh, she said, Andy, my experience at Harvard was diametrically opposite yours. I experienced it as this austere, demanding, hierarchical, when I entered as a PhD student the government department, it was a completely different story from what you describe at the Center for European Studies. This is a completely different story. In fact, she even includes the more of my heroes in the book other than my father, of course, Carl Deutsch. And she, you know, Carl Deutsch didn't give her the time of day uh, when she entered as a young graduate student that wanted to work with him was on his way to Berlin or whatever. So, um, it's, it's, I, I'm not quite sure whether these things are really, whether they can be planned. They are, they were part of a time, um, which um, I actually also think the center, uh, you know, is, is today is a very different place. I don't know it very well, but um, your last point, and I think that's very important that I also sort of leading over to Calypso is, Yes, I'm, I'm quintessentially home, not actually not Cambridge, Massachusetts. And that's, I mean, in, in, at home in the United States and in, in this continent, and that's the passport. Uh, I, I, as I started the book, I'd love to be at home. I'd love to be from Brooklyn. I'm not from Brooklyn. I can imitate Brooklyn accent. You know, I can talk like this and all that and coffee and chocolate and all but that doesn't make me a Brooklynite or a New Yorker. Um, I'd love to be that, but I'm not a Canterbridgean. I'm nowhere, I've never, you know, I lived in you know, Cambridge for almost 30 years um, and really never became a Bostonian as such. I live in Ann Arbor now for 25. It's a beautiful place. It's an intellectually vibrant place. Do I feel myself from Ann Arbor? No, I don't. Um, and so, what I find very interesting, actually, someone asked me this in from Romania. There was an interview of Romanian and Jews. And I said, Where do you feel at home? I said, I feel at home when I land in the US. Where? I said, It doesn't matter, LAX or Seattle or whatever. And that, in fact, it is the United States, and that's the passport. It's sort of the United States in a kind of weird, and I really mean this. It's, it's, it's sort of in this. Uh, it's, it's, it's the United States. I can't, that's why, and now we're getting into music and certain forms of travel and my obsession now with uh, having to see four more states, but then I will have all 50 under my belt. Uh, <laughs> North Dakota, Idaho, Montana, and Arkansas. So Arkansas will happen this July, I think. 
And by the way, it doesn't, it can't just fly in. That's not the mark of its rule. You have to spend at least one night in a hotel and spend a day in the state. So I don't have to spend more. Uh, so there's this um, um, yearning for a, a, a kind of, and that's what the passport is. Um, the passport is, uh, and the, Charlie Mayer actually said what you said also, that in some, uh, Charlie Mayer actually said, Andy, I love this book, but I think you're completely wrong. Um, you are not homeless. You are multi-homed. You are actually anchored in all these places. You have friends in all these places. You are conversant in all these languages. So in fact, it's not that you're, and I think on some level he's right, but not on the emotional level. So um, as I describe uh, in the chapter on my wife, Kiki, it was very clear from when we met after 23 years of complete uh, separation, after teenage friends and young lovers, and then much later, um, uh, when she said, I know for a fact that you will never come back to Europe. And even though there are some very, very objectionable and ugly things in the United States now that really bother me deeply. Um, it's just a non-starter. We were in Vienna again, and uh, um, Kiki would love to go back, but I'm not. I will. I just won't. And again, it's not so much because of Ann Arbor um, or New York or, or, or Cambridge. It's this this sort of abstract but emotionally immensely powerful America, which by the way also comes up in the book by my father's immense attraction to the Anglo-American liberal world. I mean that, that I mentioned that in the book. His his love of English and which he didn't speak well and he this sort of extolling of my mother of course in this case was more Literary German, although of course she also read in Hungarian to me the Palutz on Fiuk. Um, but it's sort of a more complex thing and it's very weird. Um, but it is America in this um, Simon and Garfinkel song. Uh, we all come to look for America. Um, and I've been to Saginaw and I've driven the New Jersey Turnpike and then I've had and I searched for America. And hence my love also of the most American of bands, which is Griff, that who are this on the road. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, I typically, um, you know, and, and in California, I would oftentimes just get on sort of some kind of a, a, a rural highway and just drive by myself and have this sort of amazing experience of, of being home and this got the second highway and then of course you go back and really you know and you listen to the bbc and you know do, you do you live which is not not really america but there's this interesting um, and it, yes a lot of your friends yeah. are in the audience the yes. book is all about friendship and personal relations and uh, we will manage it but also professional and so on we are very much at home in the liberal democratic world against yes. the experiences of the way your father is scared of the communists taking over Prague, and you are the um, Lido Liesolo having fun, and you hear about this, and you immediately go back because it fears that they will take over Austria as well, and you need to. And at the same time, your experience and um, about fascism and the repression and so on, this idea of defending liberal democracy, having a home in that kind of open discourse, it doesn't matter where you come from, it is an open discourse about um, that type of lifestyle that we all treasure. And I think in your book, how much you relate to people from all classes, all backgrounds and so on, the high music and the low music and the sport and the neighbor and so on, that really makes the book so fascinating. It makes the man, Andy Markovic, so fascinating. And I recommend read the book. What we haven't talked about, which is always interesting to me, is um, Andy, women, um, personal relations, it's all in the book. Um, the love for Kiki, um, these wonderful love stories in there. And of course, my I told him yesterday, my favorite or not so favorite 
um, scene in the book is Daphne Shea, oh. your first girlfriend. And the story is, this is 1964, Champions League final, Real Madrid against Inter Milan. His father, who has done everything for him, got two tickets. And here Coffey Henley convinces the father to give up the ticket for his random new girlfriend, Daphne. The father gives the ticket, Andy walks with Daphne to sue, see the game. There was a kiss at the end of the story, no, yeah, but she ignored the game. Your father was disappointed oh. and horrible, and you regret it for the rest of your life. That what your father did for you all throughout the life, and then you took the ticket away from him um, for Daphne. And I think that to some extent that you remember it, that you know how much you owe to your father oh. and how committed he was to making your life um, the life that you had, the pride that he had in you, um, the way he encouraged you and so on. And then the moment where father and son, because that relationship in the book is so close, you always refer to your father. You bring your father everywhere. You take him everywhere and so on. And Daphne takes the football team yeah, away. He doesn't know the difference between Real and Inter. Knows nothing. Shocking. And shocking. And my father really, and I, he actually exceeds for this. He lets me take her. And it was his ticket. Amazing. And then, of course, six weeks later, she dumps me. No. A rock star. <laughs> no, for actually, and this is amazing. Uh, uh, Dr. then becomes the head of the gastroenterology department at the University of Vienna Medical School. And I was just in Vienna two weeks ago, and I always go to Daphne Scher's grave and put a stone there and say Kaddish for her. And as we walk with Kiki out, suddenly I see. Uh, you know, there is this name, and I say, who is this? Who is this? I say, oh my God, you know, this is the guy who, you know, Daphne left me for. And I still put a stone and say, you know, So it summarizes it all. Mm -hmm. Read the book, it's wonderful. And so is um, Andy and his thoughts. So, Andy, very much. Yeah.